Well, the late Albert King, often regarded as one of the greatest and most influential blues guitarists of all time, got any blues fans in the house? He, along with B.B. King, Freddie King, all unrelated, were known as the kings of the blues. And in 1971, he released the track, Everybody Wants to Go to Heaven, But Nobody Wants to Die. You know, as a pastor, it, as your pastor, it's my job, it's my responsibility uh, to help you consider, whether you like it or not, but to help you consider uh, the most important things about life. And to tickle your ears with lesser things is pastoral malpractice. So everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Albert is pointing out the inconsistencies, or at least the tension that I would say probably is in most of us, between the anticipation of wanting to be with God in the holy city, the future city, the new Jerusalem, the heaven to come, but not yet being ready to go there. It would kind of be like the child that doesn't want to leave the backyard swing set and get in the car in order to go to Disney. And today, I'd like to ask you a sobering question. What's your relationship with death? What's your relationship with death? Have you come to grips with death? And some of you are in a stage in life where death is very present on your mind. It's not an abstract concept for you because of your age or maybe because of a health condition. It's something you likely have to think about on a regular basis. Others, however, um, who are at a different stage in life, perhaps rarely think of death because of your age or some kind of life situation. It's perhaps not something that you're very concerned about at the moment. But it's critical that we recognize um, our age has very little to do with our death. Meaning no one in the room is promised tomorrow. So what is your relationship with death? And I know what you're thinking. I was hoping to get a positive message today, Pastor, and we're talking about death. Um, Today, I'd like to help you discern what you're living for, and I'd like to help you wrestle with the prospect of death, as our author does in the scripture today, a man by the name of Paul. The title for today is this, to live is Christ, to die is gain. We're in this teaching series. We just began in a little book in the New Testament called uh, Philippians, and it is a letter that was written by a man named Paul, who's one of the leaders. He's an apostle. He's a sent one. He's a church planner. He's one of the leaders of the early church. Um, he's actually the, you could probably say he's, he's the greatest pastor who's ever lived. You'd probably say he's the greatest evangelist who's ever lived, the greatest church planter, um, probably could say the greatest theologian. I mean, this guy has got it all together. And God used him because of his past, and his past was not nearly, wasn't at all teed up for him to be a pastor, but God called him. Jesus saved him, uh, sent him forward on a, a mess, on, on a mission, rather, to see the church and the message of Jesus Christ go to the entire um, world. And, and Paul writes this letter to uh, these believers, these Christian believers who are wrestling, who's, who's struggling. He, he's always writing a letter to, to help them resolve something, some kind of internal conflict, some kind of challenge, some kind of issue that they are facing. And so it is with the book of Philippians. And the book is about conflict. The book is about adversity. The book is about struggle. It's about challenges. And it's a book about how to live in the struggle. Can I get an amen in the house? It's a book about how to not only survive the struggle, but also to thrive through the struggle. And so the scripture in particular, uh, this scripture is, honestly, it's one of the most shocking, bizarre, countercultural scriptures, I think, in the entire Bible. We'll get to it in a few verses. But let's, let's start with verse 19, and this, this is what the scriptures say. Paul says to these believers, for I know that through your prayers, somebody say prayers, Shout out to the prayer ministry at the bridge. Through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, which is another way of saying the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures, it's Holy Spirit or Spirit of God or Spirit of Jesus. He's talking about the Holy Spirit here. Through prayers, your prayers and the help of the Holy Spirit, this will turn out for my deliverance. 
Which, by the way, you could walk out the room today if you've got a challenge, if you've got a struggle, if, you were, if, you're having, if you're having a hard time to have hope in Christ, you just take this one verse and you'll be good to go. That, that through prayer and through the Spirit of God, that I'm believing that this is going to turn out for my deliverance. Now, remember, Paul is in a prison when he's writing this. Verse 20 says, as it is, my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored. That word in some translations is exalted or magnified. He'll be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Now, Paul is quite literally in chains. The reason that he's in chains is because as a follower of Jesus in the first century, and as a proclaimer of the gospel and a leader of the church, he was actually, in many ways by what he was saying, in direct conflict with the powers that be. He was in direct conflict with the religious system, which was essentially a, a Judaism system, and uh, the, the, the Judaism system had a hard time with him because of the, what he preached about Jesus, that Jesus was the Messiah that they had long awaited for. And then he was also in conflict with the political system and the civil system because, because the Christian message is that Jesus is Lord. They actually were uh, bankrupting the concept that the Greeks and the Romans had that Caesar is Lord. And because of this message, the, the religious system and the civil system saw this as a threat. And therefore, Paul is in prison. He is in chains in the city of Rome. And he tells us throughout the book about his imprisonment. And earlier, in uh, last week, in the, in the beginning of the chapter, he would refer to what was his, his prison sentence as the imperial guard, which have, would have actually been the praetorial guard. Now, the praetorial guard was an elite unit of imperial Roman uh, army uh, members. They really served as personal bodyguards and intelligence agents for the Roman emperors. They were essentially the Roman secret service. So how this would, would work is that because of Paul, it's crazy. Paul did, Paul's loving people. He's helping people. He's being generous. But because of his message, he's seen as a threat. And they put him in the most um, uh, significant kind of prison uh, situation or bondage that you could have. He's in chains, and he would literally would have been chained 24-7 to a member of this praetorial guard. All day long, and different ones would take different shifts, and he would be chained to them. And they would come in for a certain shift, but he, he would always be chained. And, and so he wasn't just in prison. He was chained to an individual of this, this guard. He couldn't go to the bathroom in, in privacy. He couldn't sleep in privacy. You kind of get the idea. This was the worst form of imprisonment in his day. But Paul has this, like, uncanny sense in the middle of this worst of conditions that there's a sense of joy there's a sense of positivity you can just feel as you read it. There's just, a, there's just this internal sense of something amazing, even in the light of the worst uh, kind of circumstances. So here, let me, let me say it this way, and this will be significant for the entire book and for the next few weeks. It's this point. Joy isn't dictated by the condition of your circumstances, but the condition of your faith. Joy isn't, isn't dictated, it's, it's not determined, it, it's not defined by the condition of your circumstances, but by the condition of your faith. And we never need to minimize the condition of our circumstances. You don't need to tell your spouse, stop worrying about that person, they're not that big of a deal. You don't need to tell your kids that the other kids at school aren't that really that big of a problem. You don't need to tell the person in your community group that rent isn't a big deal. It's a big deal. All those things are a big deal. We don't need to minimize the significance of our circumstances, but we need to recognize in the midst of our circumstances that the condition of our circumstances isn't the defining factor for whether or not we have joy. The defining factor is the condition of our faith. And most of Paul's ministry was done in unfavorable circumstances. Half the time he's broke, Half the time he's in prison, feels like part of the time he's, he's shipwrecked, um, it, it, see, he's, he's getting stoned in different cities, 
everybody hates him. Nobody likes him. I mean, it's like unbelievably hard. There's it's hardly ever favorable circumstances in the life and the ministry of Paul. And then as well, he's writing to a group of people, these Christians in Philippi, which most of their experience was unfavorable circumstances as well. You see, in life, the happiest people or the people with the most joy aren't those with the best circumstances or situation. They're the people who have something in the inside, on the inside that supersedes their circumstances. And in fact, the term happy, it's connected to the term happening. Happiness is primarily about what happens to you. Joy is much deeper. It has little to do with what happens to you. And here's the beautiful thing about joy. You can't buy it. It's not for sale. It only comes from something deep within you. And some of you are like believing the lie that if you just get a few things set up right in your life, then you will be positioned for joy. Now, hear me say, finances are extremely important. Relational health is very important. Vocational impact is, all those things are very important. I'm not saying none of them are important, but if you're waiting on all of those things to line up perfectly in order for you to get to a place where you can have joy, you're never going to find it. You're never going to find it. You're always going to be looking for it. You're always going to be blaming it on if that thing and if these thing and if those people, then I would finally be where I want to be. Joy doesn't come from something outside of you. It comes from something inside of you. And Paul didn't always have this kind of joy. He, he wrestled. He, he struggled. There were moments that he even despaired of life, he would say. But for him, everything changed when he found Christ. When he found Jesus, when he experienced Christ, and really Christ found him. And Paul was a really religious guy. He was an unbelievably smart guy. He was a very successful guy. But he had discovered that those things can't achieve happiness for him. It wasn't until he met Christ, as we'll see later in the book in chapter 3, once he found Christ or Christ found him, everything else, all his other credentials, basically became meaningless to him. And so Paul is writing to them and he's encouraging them that, hey, even in a prison cell, cell even in a dungeon, even in the worst of circumstances, even when the conditions are not lined up for you to have joy, you can still have joy because joy is based on the condition of your faith. Can I just ask you today and just stop here as your pastor, what are you looking for in order to find joy? What's, what's, that, what's that thing that's kind of on your mind? What's that thing that kind of is lingering in the background that you just are convinced that if you could just have that thing, then you would have joy. Let's rebuke that thought today. Let's rebuke that thought today. And maybe that thing isn't evil. Maybe that thing isn't awful. But let's rebuke that thought and come back to Christ and remind ourselves that it is only in Christ that true joy can come. And, and here's, the, here's the catch 22. Paul's going to endure suffering and the unfavorable circumstances and remain joyful but he's also going to believe God for deliverance in his, his circumstances. So hear, hear me when I say this. He is absolutely content in some sense of his suffering for Christ and where God has him, but he's also absolutely convinced, convinced that he's going to be delivered from his circumstances. And he says that through their prayers, shout out to the prayer ministry again, through their prayers and through the power of the Holy Spirit, he says, this will turn out for my deliverance. So can I speak to a couple groups of people real quick? Um, this, is, this is what happens in life. And I've become more and more aware of this the longer that I live and the longer that I, I lead. Um, most people have a proclivity to kind of lean one direction or the other. Um, mo most of the world and most of things in life are, are, are kind of a comparison contrast um, that seem like extremes, kind of a way one and way two. And, but there's often a, a way three. Um, so let me just speak to the believers in the room who are the sovereignty people, okay? These are the people that they love John Piper. I mean, they just read John Piper all day long and like, I'm going to suffer for the name of Christ and his glory will be manifested when, and he will be satisfied based on my endurance of, of, of the agony and the horrible nature of, of life. And so I'm just going to 
And so the sovereignty, folks, God's sovereign. He's sovereign over everything. So whatever I'm in, enduring, whatever I'm going through, um, it must be God's will that I'm exactly where I'm at. And I'm just going to suck it up for Jesus. And I'm just going to stay here until something changes and God changes. The, the cha- now, that's beautiful in one sense. But there's a tendency for the sovereignty people to do nothing. <laughs> you know, now, now, now let's pick on the other people, okay? Like, you're like, I can't believe you picked on me. Let's pick on the other people, okay? <laughs> the other people are the word of faith people. They're the word of faith people. They're like want to get out of their circumstances all the time. It's like there is nothing about my circumstances that has been ordained by God for this situation. And I'm just going to speak it. I'm going to name it. I'm going to believe it. I'm going to get out of this thing as quick as possible. And you're like, there's a tendency on this side to like, you know, you know to see everything around you as like awful and, de- and demonic and the evil made me do or the devil made me do it. And this is like, I didn't get this parking place because of the, de- because of the demons that are in this in Walmart. And like, you know, and it's like, I, I have to be like, I have to be relieved from these circumstances. All right. Now these are, these are, here's what you need. And this is what Paul has. He has both. He's like at the same time, and this is crazy. He's absolutely convinced of God's sovereignty for where he's at. He, he, he even would say that it's an honor to suffer for Christ in this situation. He's like, he's like, thank God I get to be in these chains and be in this prison cell and eat horrible food for the next few days and whatever's going to he, he's, he's resting in God's sovereignty, but then he's also absolutely believing in deliverance. He's speaking deliverance. This is going to turn out and God's going to redeem the day and God's going to save. And let me just let you know, you need both. And so you got two people in your community group and this is the sovereignty person and this is the word of faith person and you take shots at each other. Guess what? You need each other. You need each other. You, you need to believe in both. And we're going to see in, in Paul's life and his situation that even in his suffering, he endures it um, and he recognizes God's sovereignty over the situation, but he's believing for a change, believing for a breakthrough, even in the midst of his circumstances and situation, whether by life or by death. And then he says this in verse 21. In verse 21, he says this, for to me, maybe not to everybody, but to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Probably a top 20 most popular verse in the entire Bible. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Which, by the way, did you get, did you get your memory verse card when you, when you got in the house today? If you're in person, did you, did you get your card? Like I said last week, gra- gra- this, every week I'm encouraging you to, to memorize the, the bu- Stand up if you memorize, I'm just kidding, if you memorized the verse last, last week. Um, we had one last, last week. And um, um, I had to work hard on my wife, but she finally memorized it by the end of the week. I'm just joking. Um, but take the card, put it somewhere, put it on your dash, uh, put it on your bathroom mirror, as I said last week, put it on your spouse's forehead, whatever you got to do to like help memorize uh, the verse. And this, this is the verse. This, this is our verse for this week, which is, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I love the way that the New Living Translation translates this. Living means living for Christ and dying is even better. I love what the pastor, or Pastor Tim Keller says on this. He says, Paul has a definition of life that enables him to face anything, even death. So let's ask the question, what is your definition of life? What is your definition of life? Meaning, many of us define a successful life as the ability to escape death, the ability to live as long as possible. And as long as I am escaping death, then I'm actually successful in my life. I'll just advocate that's not a great life purpose. What is your definition of life? What is success for you in life? What is meaning for you in life? What is purpose for you in in life? And the way that you think about your life's purpose has a direct correlation to the way that you think about your own death. I'll say it this way. Your relationship with death will be shaped by your purpose in life. Your relationship with death, the way that you think about death, the way that you face death, your emotions, your feelings, your thoughts related to death will be shaped by your purpose in life. So what is your purpose in in life? Um, I, I, you've heard me say I work out in this uh, men's workout group that's across the nation. It's called F3. Any F3 uh, fans in the house today? F3, um, three of us. Okay, F3, and um, it's amazing. Um, no, but uh, it's really cool. There's, there's, it's, it's really, it's not, it's more than a workout group. It's really a leadership engine. It's pretty awesome. But they have this thing called the 
ULP. Uh, it stands for a couple things. It stands for one thing, the ultimate life problem. And then they also, the ULP stands for the ultimate life purpose. And they actually ask um, men to determine what is their ultimate life purpose. What is your purpose? In, what is your ULP? What is your ultimate life purpose? Why do you exist? And you're like, would you please help me, Pastor, figure that? Yes, I will. Here's, here's how. Here's three questions. Three questions to help you figure this out. Here's the first one. What's the one thing you feel you couldn't live without? Do a little introspection here. What's the one thing that you feel like you couldn't live without? Another question to help. What's the one thing that consumes most of your thoughts? It's a thing that's kind of stirring. It's kind of going. It's kind of like, it's, all, it's, all, it's always moving. The mind's always racing about this, this thing. What, what's the one thing that people most identify you by? Oh, you know, you know John. He's, you know, he's a, you know, or you, you, you know Mary. She's, you know, what's the, what's the thing that most people identify you by? What do you live for? What do you live for? What, what is your purpose? Is your purpose living as long as possible? Is your purpose building a family? Is your purpose building a business? Is it experiencing relationships? Is it perhaps making a difference in the world? Is it getting that dream home? Having that dream career? X, Y, and Z. And Paul has discovered how Christ is his ULP, his ultimate life purpose. I love the way that one of my friends, Mike Ashcraft, he says this all the time. He says, you were made for God. You were made for God. I just love the way that that is phrased. So hear me when I say, you were made for him. You were made for Christ. You were made for God. And I love the first question and answer of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. It says this, this is the very first one. It says, what is the chief end of man? The answer, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. See, Paul has discovered that living is Christ and therefore dying is gain. I counted it up. I'm like, he talks about Christ like in almost every verse in this chapter. I counted it. He mentions Christ 19 times in chapter one. It's literally almost in, in every verse. And this is the only scenario that you can ever find where dying is gain. This is the only formula where dying is better than living. And the reason that most of us are so uncomfortable with dying is because we're not living for Christ. And Paul is completely content with dying. It's a little concerning. <laughs> it's a little, this is why I said this is one of the most shocking, bizarre scriptures in the entire Bible. It's a little concerning. He's like, yeah, I'd like to die. I think it would be cool. Here, this is what he says. Look in verse 22. He's, it's, it's crazy. He says, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor uh, for me. I'll be able to do some good work around here and be able to do some good ministry. He says, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. He's on the fence. He's like, should I live? Should I die? I just can't make a decision. I don't know what to do. He says in verse 23, I am hard pressed between the two, which means he's trying to make a decision between the two. My desire, what I really want to do is to depart, leave you crazy people and be with Christ. For that is far better. It's crazy. But he says to remain in the flesh, to stick around you people, it's more necessary on your account. Y'all need some help. <laughs> Y'all need a few more letters. I need to, hopefully I'll come and see you guys because we need to do some work. Verse 25, convinced of this, I know that I will remain. He knows that his work is not done. He's going to remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith for their sake. So that in me, you may have ample calls to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. It's absolutely bizarre. Paul's like, life or death? I mean, stay here on the earth, stay here a little bit longer, live a little bit longer, 
or die and uh, be with Christ forever. And Paul's like, I would rather be with Christ. That is far better. Do you believe today that it would be better to be with Christ? You're like, but man, but I mean, like, you know, Pastor Ethan, but you know, I mean, but my family, you know, and like, you know, but you know, kind of like that trip that I kind of been wanting to go on, you know, and like I'm doing really good in Minecraft and I'm about to get to that level where like, I mean, I'm getting really close. Like don't quite, I'm not quite ready to, to be with Christ. Do you, do you believe that it's far better to be with Christ? And Paul, this is crazy. Paul chooses the opposite of his preference. Paul actually would rather be gone. He'd be, he'd be way better. He, he would rather be gone, but he's like choosing the opposite of his preference. He's making a decision that is actually not his own convenience and not his own comfort. He's actually doing what is the opposite for the good of other people. What is this, by the way? This is leadership. This is leadership. Leadership is never doing what's best for you, but doing what's best for others. Leaders, and this is what we're going to see in the life of Paul. Leadership is never about doing what is best for you. It's about doing what's best for others. Leadership is never about your own well-being, but the well-being of others. It's having the others as your framework, as your first category. That's what being a leader is. And if you don't have that framework, you don't need to be a leader. Leader, leader means, being a leader means that I'm willing to actually deny myself of maybe the things that I would want to do in order to make a better impact on the whole. And this is what Paul does. Paul's like, I'd rather be doing other things, y'all. I'd rather be, I, I've got a lot of things that I'd like to do and be with Christ and we'd have a good old time and I'm ready for my mansion and glory. But for your sake, I'm gonna stick around and, and I'm going to work hard and it's not going to be easy, but I'm going to, to give my life for the sake of benefiting other people. Remember last week we talked about the doulos, the servant, that he has, he's a servant of Christ, that he's gonna give of his, his life first to Christ and then to others. He's got this posture of a servant which actually allows him to be a leader. Some of you work for a leader right now who's not a servant and it is driving you crazy and it should because the leader doesn't care about your well-being. They just care about the power of doing whatever they want to do for themselves. Leadership is never about having the power to do what you want to do. It's about doing what's best for other people. And so I'll say it this way, and this is the way that we say it with our elders and our leadership as a church. Leadership is not a position of superiority. It's a position of sacrifice. I tell the elders this, I mean, especially when we, we have new elders that, that join, our, join our team, our, our elder team. I say, hey guys, you just need to recognize what you're signing up for is not going to be easy. This is not going to be like a walk in the park and have fun with Pastor Ethan, and we're going to go on like trips and conferences and just have a good old time. No, you're going to suffer. This is going to, there's going to be a major, can I say this, a suck factor to this situation that's getting ready to happen. It is not going to go well. If, if you didn't like that, I'm sorry, but it's, it's not about superiority. It's not, not about getting your way. It's not about changing the thing that you've always wanted to change in the church. No, no, it's about sacrifice. It's about give, giving up. Um, you're convenient. And, and, and can I just say, like, I mean, we, we are, you know, it's very obvious. We're far from perfect. And, and I said last week that church is messy and the bridge church is, is messy. And there, there's a lot. Of, we're, we're broken, infallible, um, sinful people that are trying to figure out how to follow the straight and narrow. And we don't always get it um, right. But um, can I just say, and I think this is just a great little moment in time to say this, that I have never been more encouraged by our elders and our leadership. The way that they sacrifice, the way that they give of their time and their energy, um, you never know. You, you, just, you just never know. And I know, I know that's hard, but you don't see what goes on behind closed doors. You don't see what happens behind the curtain. You just don't get the ability to see. Um, but these men, um, and outside of myself, they're they're all unpaid. They're all non-staff. And they give literally hours, dozens of hours every month for the sake of our church. Can we honor our elders just for while we're like um, Adam and um, Adam and Brandon and Reese and yeah. Um, just you just need to know that I mean we're far from perfect, but we've got men uh, who are in a leadership position that are sacrificing for your good, for your health. 
uh, trying to make the best decisions for the church and for our own health. And uh, they care about you and they care about the health of the church. And this is the model that the Apostle Paul gives us, which he's willing to do what's inconvenient and uncomfortable for himself for the good and the well-being of others. And then he, and then he says this in, in verse 27, and this, this will be our final, final section. Paul says, therefore, <clears throat> because of all that, um, only let your manner of life, which is an interesting way of saying the way you live, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. This word worthy, maybe in some of your translations, is uh, translated citizens who are worthy. There, there's, it's a little, there's some discrepancy in this word, but it actually has this idea of citizenship in it. And so Paul says, let the way that you're living as Jesus followers, the way that you're going to live as citizens of Jesus, is, in, uh, is according to the gospel of Christ. Okay, not according to the society, not according to the government, not according to your workplace, not according to your TikTok reel, but according to the gospel of Christ. Let that be the thing that determines the way that you live so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. All of next week is going to be that idea of oneness together as a body. And he says in verse 28, and not frightened, <clears throat> you don't have to be fearful, <clears throat> you don't have to be alarmed, not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. Verse 29, for it has been granted to you, it's a gift. Somebody say it's a gift. Yeah. What's the gift? Here's the gift. For it's been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. You're welcome. Suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. As we close, I'm gonna ask the band to, to join us as we as we think about this final thought. This is so counterintuitive, y'all. And you need to understand and you need to recognize that if Christianity and if following Jesus is going to work for you, the only way that it's going to work for you is if you follow the counter-cultural strategy that Scripture lays out for us. If you're like, well, I'm kind of down with Jesus and I kind of I'm with this kind of church thing and I'm gonna hang out for a little while, but then I'm going to like I think Tony Robbins would be like a good way to like help me understand the way that I should follow Jesus. I love Tony Robbins to death, but following his strategy will not work in the, in the kingdom of God. If you try to take the world's strategies for kingdom principles, it's just never going to work. And this is an absolutely countercultural principle that Paul says that you have the gift of the opportunity to suffer for Christ. <clears throat> Suffering is not easy. Suffering is challenging. Suffering means that you will, so it'll cost you. Suffer, suffering means that it'll, it'll cost you relationships. It'll cost you personal health. It'll cost you some of your future. It'll, it'll cost you maybe plans and dreams and things. <clears throat> suffering is challenging. It's miserable, but suffering can also be motivational. Suffering can be motivational, which means you can suffer in such a way that you actually have joy in the midst of your suffering because of the impact that your suffering is going to have on others. It reminds me of uh, uh, Friday night. I was at, I was at, I was at the girls' school. My, my girls go to Gregory Elementary, just right down the street, and um, they had their, uh, their spring fling Friday night out on the field, and it was a disaster. But anyways, we had a great time, and um, no, we had, a, we had a good time, and um, and the girls all day, we, we have this little tradition. We try to have some traditions as a family, and we do some daughter, uh, daddy-daughter dates, and uh, we, we, do, uh, we always do sunset slush after school on Friday because it's right across the street, and they love it. And, but we said, today, girls, you're not getting sunset slush because we know you're going to want pelican snowballs at the spring fling. They were a little upset, but they were excited about pelican snowballs. We showed up to the spring fling, and the line for pelican snowballs was, uh, was like half a mile long. You know, like, <clears throat> I walked up, and I'm like, I, I, internally, I'm like, so, one of us is going to have to stand um, in that line. One of us is going to have to, um, to go through that. I hate long lines, by the way. Can I get a witness in the house? I just hate long lines. They're of the devil. Um, I think they're demonic. 
Um, I think the DMV is controlled by Satan. I really do. It's, um, it's, uh, I'm sorry if you work for the Department of Motor Vehicles. So we will pray for you. Uh, but I, for whatever reason, and I typically hate like these, these kind of big festival things. I would like rather just be doing my own thing. I'm high introvert. Um, but it was just like, you know what? I'm going to go stand in that line. And I'm going to stand in that line. And, uh, and I'm going to let the girls do all the other stuff. And I'm just going to sit there. And um, I'm not joking, y'all. It took like an hour and 15 minutes to get to the front of the line. The mom in front of me, God bless her soul. She was about to lose her ever-living mind. And I almost laid hands right there in Jesus' name. And like, we're going to pray for you. Um, uh, but it's just a little kind of like, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this so that they can play. And because I, because in that moment, not always, but because in that moment, I realized that there was a benefit that was happening to others, I was okay to endure a little bit of suffering for a while for, for them. That, that's the way that we have to think about our own suffering. And, and here's, here's the last point. Here's what I'll say. As Christ's suffering was a gift to you, so your suffering is a gift to him. Christ has suffered for you. He, he's gone to the cross for you. He gave his very life for you. He took on the ultimate form of suffering and it even cost him his life. And because he suffered for you, you actually have the gift now to suffer for him. That means whatever God calls you to do, wherever he sends you, whatever he has appointed you to do, whatever suffering you experience for the name of Christ is a gift to Jesus himself and the people that you are serving. serving. And in light of eternity. This only makes sense with the, an eternal viewpoint. And I'll close with this scripture. It says this, 2 Corinthians 4, 14. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, speaking of his body, our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond comparison. So here's what you got to do. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Imagine today I, I took a pen. Let's see, I've got a pen. The, the very best, the Pilot G2.05. Imagine I took this pen, and I, I started on this wall, and I, I would not make marks on our walls, but imagine I went all the way around the room, all, all the way down the side, all the way around the back, and I made a line, and came all the way down this side, and we've got black walls here, so it wouldn't work. But when we think about eternity, and we think about this life, and what we're living now, and then what eternity is waiting for us, the line represents eternity, and the one pin dot represents your life. That's how long your life is in comparison to eternity. So therefore, with that viewpoint and that mindset, we're willing to suffer whatever it is that Christ has for us for the sake of his glory and the good of other people and for the sake of eternity. And Paul says, I kind of want to slap him here, but he says, this light and momentary affliction, like Paul, prison is not light. It doesn't feel momentary. It doesn't feel like I'm ever going to get through this situation and this loss and this hardship and this challenge and this adversity. It doesn't feel very light, Paul. It doesn't feel very momentary. But Paul says, if you'll just look up, if you'll just look up, and if you'll look at eternity, you'll recognize that this moment, it's just light and it's momentary and light of eternity. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Church, uh, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed today, let's just enter into prayer before the Lord and help him to seal this in our hearts. Father, today, in Jesus' name, we just ask that you would help us to treasure Christ above all things, that he would be our ultimate life purpose, and that we would even view death and entering the glory of Christ as far better than this own life. So Holy Spirit, do the work in us and transform us. Uh, let us feel what Paul feels and see what Paul feels and transform us from the inside out. Hey, church, with your head bowed and your eyes closed today, hey, what kind of business do you need to do with God today? It's, maybe you need to make the decision to actually give your life to God.
today. Maybe you've never done that. Maybe you've never trusted Christ. Maybe today you need to, in a prayer before him, a prayer can't save you, but faith can. Maybe you would pray, pray in faith today to God. God, today I ask that you would save me. God, today I give you my life. I trust what Christ has done, his life, his death, and his resurrection for me. I receive your salvation. Church, what is the thing that has kind of been robbing you and stealing your joy because you've been putting your ultimate purpose in that, your ultimate happiness in that? What's, what's the thing maybe that the Lord is kind of pruning a little bit today? What's he shaping in order so that you can be reminded and experience that Christ is the ultimate?